um, is just, I have a series of questions here I was going to ask Mike that I came up with to ask my stenographers what their thoughts are, and I, I will just have them introduce themselves as they go down the line here and just briefly describe their background and uh, what, the, what brought them here to ultrasound and mental education. So this is Nora. Um, good afternoon. My name is Nora. I did my ultrasound training at Orange Coast College here in Costa Mesa, um, 2007. And I trained at Hoke Hospital in Newport Beach for a few years. And then I reconnected with Dr. Fox, and he told me about this great job opportunity to help him with the uh, ultrasound in the medical curriculum. And I jumped on it. And, um, And here we are today. Hi everybody, my name is Brenda Nash, and um, I, like Nora as well, graduated from Orange Coast College. Um, initially my background is in public health, I did my undergrad at Berkeley, and then moved down to Southern California. Wanted to go back to school, get back into the healthcare field, and uh, decided to go into ultrasounds. Started off as a model initially. They recruited me as a model, and I was actually modeling for the medical students here. And um, when Nora found out that I was going to graduate, which is in 2013, she thought, hey, why don't you come on, on part of our team and help us out? And so that's how I came on board. And I've been here since 2013, so about two years now. I'm currently still active in the field as well, so I'm here part time. And I actually traveled to the Kaisers in the different areas. So as far north as Panorama City and down here in Orange County. Um, I'm also at West Med in um, Anaheim, West Med, which is a trauma center, so I'm there as well. And then I come here and I help teach and help out with the team as well as that education. So that's my background. Thank you for being here. Yeah, the big microphone. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting jabbed here on the big microphone. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm Catherine Kanamori. Um, I Graduated from ultrasound school at OCC in 2013 with this gal here. And she got me into scanning with um, the students here. And it was really cool. I really loved it. So um, I now work at Huntington Beach Hospital as a sonographer. And I love it. And before that, I did an 18-month clinical rotation at St. Mary's in Long Beach. And um, learned a lot. <laughs> Saw a lot. So. Um, but I love ultrasound, and it's definitely integral to the ER and all over the hospital because we scan ICU, NICU, um, inpatients, outpatients, everybody. So, and it's it's definitely needs to be integrated into the medical school. So I'm glad you guys are doing it and a part of it. So that's what I have to say. Do you want to make microphone? Okay, no, I'm okay. Are you sure? Okay. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Danny. Can you hear me out there, everybody? Okay, I'm a seven-year ultrasound tech. I graduated as well from OCC, so what a testament to that college, <laughs> <laughs> all graduating and still in the field and loving it, apparently. Um, I uh, work full-time at Western Medical Center. It's a trauma center. It's a high-traffic OBGYN and mother-baby NICU as well, so um, we have also uh, critical care and an ICU. Um, or cardiac care in, a, in an intensive care unit. And um, like everybody else, I really am happy to see ultrasound starting to become a little bit more of a, um, an, a little bit more of an understanding of what can be done with ultrasound. I do see a lot of the physicians coming into the hospital really, really encouraged and encompassing what kind of resolution and, and kind of uh, penetration and superficial resolution we have for foreign bodies for for really almost anything as long as the obstacle as far as a vacuum of air or uh, ossification of bone or some other type of um, obstruction is in the way that sometimes we can still use that artifact as an um, idea of what we're looking at so um, definitely encouraged to where we're going and I'm happy because it's job security for me. <laughs> Well, well, thank you, panel, for uh, the introductions, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off um, by asking uh, Nora here. Nora is full-time um, with, with me uh, for the past, uh, gosh, four years now, and uh, so she's um, sort of my, the person that really runs the, 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 the program, and Brenda is half-time with me and, and half-time clinical, 
and the other two folks you see here definitely jump in and help teach when, when we need them and they're very very helpful there for teaching but they're mostly clinical sonographers so I like having that whole that whole spectrum here that you can see so thanks thanks for everybody for coming um, so Nora what what's your typical day like as the ultrasound coordinator like what does that mean how, how would you define your day um, well it's definitely behind the computer um, we definitely coordinate all four years of school um, so it's definitely preparing for their clinical foundations that they have. The first years have seven throughout their year, and um, the second years have eight throughout the year, and then we uh, reach out to the third and fourth years during their uh, elective that they do with the emergency, um, emergency elective, ultrasound elective. Um, so it's definitely juggling all four years, but it's been really great because a lot of our students um, love ultrasound and they help and they created an ultrasound interest group and we have then evening electives that they mainly spearhead but we obviously um, are guiding them with, with these electives that they put together. So it's definitely a lot of um, student interaction which has been really fun and great and seeing them grow and um, Brenda and I created a tutoring session because um, we do provide them a ultrasound unit in their student lounge 24-7 but we were afraid for them to create any bad habits not having anyone there to help help them so we created a workshop during a lunch break that they could come and we're there to help them get those um, images that they are struggling with since we only have so many sessions throughout the year with them so we definitely make ourselves very available for them, and we want this curriculum to just be one of the best, and we just keep trying to improve it and create new ideas to make that happen. How much uh, would you say you divide your time between teaching and doing administrative work? Um, it's 50-50, it's I guess you could say. Um, I really love being with the students and teaching them. So with the... Um, Elect, I'm sorry, well with the elective we help teach them and it's a peer-to-peer -peer, so we refresh their memory the fourth, third and fourth years and teach them and they help us teach the first and second years and we, all, we are also there for them um, multiple ways. So I would say 50-50. Cool. Okay, great. Um, what about, um, does, do students come along with a clinical question sometimes that stump you or ask you something like, how would you integrate this into clinical care? At what point do you feel that your role, your skills, your, you stop and then you need someone else, like a physician, to jump in and answer a clinical question? So I think that's one of something people are wondering about all the time. Most definitely. It happens quite a bit. And we have a really great team here <laughs> that we have ultrasound fellows, and they help us with these um, situations. And when we have our clinical foundation teaching <coughs> sessions, they are able to answer those questions. But if I'm in the room teaching them, I make sure to get back to them as soon as I can with an answer to their question, um, either from myself getting it from Dr. Fox or the ultrasound fellows or having them answer it um, directly to the student. And another question I have is, um, how well do you feel integrated into all of medical education? Like this is a big building here, there's a lot going on, there's people teaching from anatomy, physiology, pathology, all, there's a lot of different curriculum going on here. Do you feel part of that do you, or do you feel like you're sort of an outlier? Um, in the very beginning, a little bit on the island, but um, to be honest, it has been really great. Uh, the medical education building and staff have been really <coughs> welcoming and have actually approached us by saying, um, how about let's integrate an ultrasound portion to the family medicine rotation OSCE and to the surgical um, rotation OSCE. And we're like, well, this is perfect because they're coming to us now instead of us always asking um, for, for help or whatnot, so it's been great. I think it's interesting that I came to work one day and I saw them doing family medicine OSCEs and I didn't even know we had a family medicine OSCE. Like they went behind me straight to them to, and that's when you know the program is really flourishing and that's when you know you have the right people when 
you could be doing something else and now it continues to, to flourish and evolve that way. And, and so I think that was a, it's an interesting thing. Yeah, I definitely see how that, I mean, they, they, they pull you into all kinds of, of, of uh, meetings and, yes. and things now. You guys are constantly involved in a lot more administrative duties I see now than when you first got here and I thought you were just going to be like mm -hmm. teaching all the time. And now that you have trained a lot of teachers, I feel like you're sort of getting out of that role a little bit more and more into administrative role. We're going through curriculum reform like all of you probably are right now. Like it's constantly ongoing curriculum reform. And so we have these meetings every Monday. Tell us about that. So every Monday at 1 o'clock, um, we meet with a, a group of um, faculty and we just keep trying to figure out how to make best of the medical curriculum. And it's just all aspects of the curriculum. All aspects. And it's just great when they're like, well, how can we get more ultrasound in these blocks and whatnot? So it's, it's just very exciting that, again, we have the support of the entire building to even add more ultrasound to the curriculum, not shape it down or whatnot. So I think that's really important take home message that as, as the curriculum changes, if I have to be at a meeting or I have something going on in my department working clinically and I can't be at that Monday meeting, sometimes I miss them, like they're there and I'm jumping in and, and are able to really meaningfully help continue to wedge ultrasound in the curriculum as, we, as this curriculum is constantly changing. So I think that, again, you start off in a sonography teaching role and you evolve into this administrative, now you're part of the curriculum committee for the new curriculum. And it, it, it's something I think neither one of us really saw on the horizon when we first started working together. So I think that's been really fun. Tell us about the near peer experience and how you uh, facilitate that. Um, so I, I freshly spoke about it a, a moment ago. Um, it's really great because again, we have the third and fourth years do the um, elective. And I say it's a bonus when they are on the rotation uh, or the elective during clinical foundations because then they come and teach the first and second years. Um, we definitely, Dr. Fox provides a podcast for the students and that's how they watch the, the lecture and they come prepared, the students come prepared to scan at their allotted um, scheduling time. And we, we pride ourselves in having small class sizes. So three um, students per teacher and model is considered a big class for us. Um, they have one hour with an instructor and a model during that time, and they all definitely make sure to get that stick time that they really need to really understand ultrasound. And the instructors, um, Brenda and I, are available and are needed, and of course we jump in, but we have the elective students teach these um, courses, and we refresh them with the objectives earlier that day. So when it comes to the teaching sessions from one to five, they are ready to, um, to teach their class. How much time do you spend dealing with ultrasound machine technical support, like the machines that break or uh, troubleshooting? Um, well, not much, but we come across some older units that need a little bit more attention. Um, we've been using the newer ones, so it's been really lovely to have those and not have to um, troubleshoot and call services for assistance. Um, but definitely with the older units, it, it's, it's quite often. How much time do you spend um, with resource allocation? Meaning students are going to go on a trip somewhere and now they want to bring machines with them. Um, how do you do that? Like, what do you, how do you do that? I don't even know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what we do is we definitely meet with the groups of students and um, see how many machines they actually need. And with our ultrasound research coordinator, he really helps um, have the students focus on giving us a, a good number, not just an extravagant number since we don't have um, endless units to give out. So it's really great that we, they come to us all the time, which is really nice. Our door is always open for them. And they ask if we could have seven units. And Brenda and I, we make sure that they are running correctly and um, have enough battery supply or an extra battery and then we were able to loan them out to them. So it depends on the research and location. Some need more units than others. And sometimes we have outreach sessions, so sometimes students, sorry. <laughs> sometimes um, there's programs like um, uh, high school outreach programs that they have going on here. Sometimes the students want to check out equipment so that they can go to like an outreach session after maybe their alma mater high school.
school and whatnot. So there's other things besides just research where the students check out the ultrasound machines and they make those machines accessible to them so they can check out, you know, those portable ultrasound machines for outreach workshops and whatnot. Cool. You had a question, sir? So during these one-hour sessions, do you sometimes use a simulator as opposed to the actual probe? Um, yes, of course. We, um, we mainly focus for the first years what normal looks like. So we definitely use um, our models for that. And they're undergrad students, and a lot of them are um, pre-med. So they really actually um, take advantage of this situation because they learn so much just being a model for our students. And com coming towards the second year, that's when we really focus on throwing in the uh, simulators for the um, pathology aspect of, of ultrasound. Particularly the OSCEs. Definitely I'm going to ask sort of an awkward question. Um, as your boss, and my opinion of money, how much money do you make doing this job as opposed to your clinical job? And the clinical people can answer this, answer this question probably better. I mean, I think it's always good to say what the salaries are and be completely transparent and open about it because it's really a real question. Because how much everybody's wondering, we talk a lot about finances and grants and stuff, and people are wondering what does it cost to hire somebody full time to do this and not work clinically as a sonographer. So feel free to tell us about that as blatantly as you can. Uh, well, I've been, out, <laughs> <with you. laughs> I've been out in the field for some time now, and um, I'm definitely not making what I would be making out in, in the hospital or a clinical aspect. Um, Just to give you a number, I know yeah. Kaiser, Kaiser is. For a per diem position, I could be making fifty dollars an hour working for Kaiser. Just to give an idea. And so what am and I here, paying? Um, Thirty-seven dollars. <laughs> I'm making less than that. I'm like thirty-four. <laughs> yeah, I know that. One. So, but um, honestly, I, we could have easily left, and um, Brenda could easily be full time at her uh, other job. But we truly love being here. We wouldn't be here um, for the money. Uh, because it's, it's just been really great, especially when the student comes to you and just are so ecstatic and I love it and I'm, I, I could do it, I understand it, it helped me with my anatomy class. It's a lot of different puzzle pieces and it really links in together and the students really appreciate it. And just knowing in general, just knowing that I'm helping the student learn how to obtain a window where this could potentially be my child. This could be my son, you know? I want to make sure the student knows what they're doing and how to obtain those windows because that could be my family member in there. So just knowing being a part of that is in itself really, really rewarding. I can say a few things here. Yeah. Thanks, Danny. Yeah. How's your thoughts? Um, <laughs> now I don't get nearly as much as paid as the Kaiser techs do, <laughs> but I don't nearly have as much work as they do. <laughs> yes, <it's true. laughs> so that gives me the chance to really kind of have a lot better rapport with our physicians. Um, the trauma physicians, they tend to, tend to be a little bit more off-putting. They either kind of do their fast scans, which I love, and their, the, the ability for them to utilize ultrasound is amazing. Um, the others that I call the Blackberry carriers, they don't even care about ultrasound. That ultrasound stays in the corner, they, they, they are, but they'll, they'll, they'll soon pass and, and, the, and everybody else will soon realize kind of what, what kind of um, care you could get. Now the pay, the pay definitely corresponds to the amount of sputum and the amount of onslaught of emotional and physical torment you'll get out there. Um, I, it's, it's funny because uh, you, you think it'd be so much more rewarding actually helping the people out there with their pathologies and filling them in. Um, but really I, I do, even though I am more exhausted, being one of the uh, expert um, clinical uh, experts that kind of help the three-on-three -three classes, it, it really is rewarding to know that, again, this type of field is being utilized and is encouraged and I do see some ambition. Some I don't, but that's unfortunate because it, it, is, it is a utilized field and, and sometimes with those real-time scans and you want to see what that foreign body is or what that fluid collection is or what that is, sometimes a CT or palpable um, interpretation won't do it. So anyway, so yeah, I, I, I definitely um, I get paid a little bit better, especially just coming in and being the um, 
um, just the kind of guide for the hour long, three or four hour long each session. Um, not nearly as much compensated, but I do feel very good walking away from it. So the, the, the compensation is really relative to, to, um, to how you feel and what you want out of it. You know, I can go elsewhere if I wanted to, but I probably wouldn't have as, as a fulfilling and rewarding of an end of the day as I do, so. Thank you. So when you hire somebody um, at the University of California, UCI is the largest employer of Orange County. And so Orange County's got like four and a half million people in it. UCI is the biggest employer of Orange County. Uh, the second largest employer of Orange County is Disneyland. So we're bigger than Disneyland when it comes to employees. And so when it comes to hiring somebody in such a massive company, basically, you know, enterprise, you have to go through a lot of um, HR rules and stuff. And so I had to create job descriptions and everything to, to hire um, people. And so if you want those job descriptions, feel free to email me and I'll just send you that document because I had to write it just a certain way so that it would meet a certain salary requirement because if you don't write it the right way, they're not gonna get paid enough and they won't. Because the, the university sets the salary, not me. So, and so if you're gonna try to recruit them the right way, you gotta write the job, job description the right way. It just dawned on me the battle this. And so you need to just be careful how you use those words because if you, if you write it too much, if you don't write it clinical enough, then they'll see this as too educational and then the salary comes way down. But if you write a little bit more clinically, even though they're not really doing clinical work and making patient decisions, but you can say this is going to impact clinical workflow, and if you can use certain language there that the people that, that decide how much to pay them see that word clinical in there, and they start the salary starts to get turned off. So I can send you that stuff, no problem. Question? What would you say your faculty-student ratio is when you're teaching hands-on clinical scanning skills? Faculty-student ratio when you're teaching hands-on clinical skills. During my, during, can I answer? Sure, yeah. I, I don't do much of the curriculum. Again, I just do some of the practicum. And I usually don't see more than four students, three to four students per, per class. So that's plenty of time for them to, to bounce off each other when they go along their way and, and still enough time to let them pay attention. So we, we have, um, we break the class into half. So half of the students come on Tuesday and half on Thursday, so we have um, an hour, a lot of time scheduled for each um, group. And so it's, we run six rooms with six instructors, six models, and then the biggest class will be three students per that model and instructor. So three to one, two to one. Three to one, two to one. Doesn't always work out, somebody's placed at the last second, but that's our goal. Yes, Rachel. Uh, maybe a couple questions, but, um, was there any difficulty in transitioning um, between what you guys traditionally learned in um, sonography school into what we do for medical school, which is basically bedside ultrasound or even little components of bedside ultrasound? It's a good yeah. question. So, so translating between what a sonographer traditionally learns, a more detailed, comprehensive examination, as opposed to a point of care examination. Um, it is different, and when I um, did a presentation at Orange Coast College trying to recruit students to take advantage of extra time um, scanning or even um, networking and being involved in this program, um, it's it's definitely, um, so sorry. It's a transition. transition. Yeah, transitioning to it. Sorry. I lost my train of thought. I apologize. <laughs> so to answer your question, we have to remind ourselves sometimes that this is not a sonography school. These are med students. So we need to like hold ourselves back at times. So for example, when we're helping Dr. Fox grade the OSCE exams, we're like, okay, as long as they've got, you know, what they need, the organ, you know, that, that's good. The depth doesn't have to be perfect, you know, the gain doesn't have to be perfect. As long as you can see, good. We have to hold ourselves back because, again, in sonography school, we go A, B, C, D, you know, it's like, how big is it, you know, size and whatnot, and epigenicity. And we're here, it's just, it's kind of a more of a yes or no question. Is it free fluid? Is it not free fluid? So we kind of have to hold ourselves back and ignore and remind ourselves, nope, it's not a sonography school, it's going to be easy when we grade them, you know, but difficult enough so that they've obtained the image that they need to obtain and hold the organ of interest. You guys are pretty good at, at yourselves and reminding yourselves yeah. that we, we, that have we to. balance each other out. We definitely balance each other out. But I guess that leads into my second question. How would you answer um, sonography um, or sonographer naysayers who say, you 
guys shouldn't be teaching this to medical school because you're going to take away their jobs, right? 